I have a trail that I walk. It's called Colson Strip. It's an old strip that I used to take when I would run away because I know cops wouldn't find it. After I hit um, the first group home I went to, that was my childhood, it was gone. Still to this day, I have no idea why anyone thought that having kids with no charges and bad trauma issues to be in a residential facility with violent kids was a good idea. Now that I'm in the free, I'm more defensive. Like over there, like I just learned I gotta punch first, you know, I gotta hit first. What it's like to be in the system, I feel like people misunderstand it a lot. They really do. Whatever happened with Cornelius, if that would have never happened, probably to this day, I'd probably still be at Lakeside. We grew up together. I was 11, he, I would say he was about 10. Met at the beach. Um, we were all swimming and stuff. I taught Cornelius how to swim that day, and then I'll say about six months after that, we fell into each other in a residential facility, and um, that's when I met Cornelius again. We both funny, uh, we always smiling. We both love rapping. He loved food, I just like cooking it. On April 29th, 2020, 16-year-old Cornelius Frederick threw a sandwich in the cafeteria of Lakeside Academy, the Michigan youth facility where he had been placed by the foster system. CCTV footage shows seven staff restraining Cornelius for almost 12 minutes. When they release him, he's limp and unconscious. Another 12 minutes pass before anyone calls 911 or try CPR. The for-profit company that managed Lakeside, Sequel Youth and Family Services, lost its license in Michigan after Cornelius died. But across the country, Sequel continued to run 27 other facilities, where kids were placed for foster care, juvenile offenses, addiction, autism, or behavioral problems, often in mixed groups. Over the past year, we've been investigating conditions in every single one. Vice News sent Freedom of Information Act requests to 20 states that work with SQL. 14 of those states sent us 15,000 pages of documents. We have licensing reports, we have internal emails, and we have inspections. These are from the last three years. And within these documents are hundreds of serious violations. We've read them all, and we've tried to spot patterns that are occurring between different facilities. One of the most troubling things we've found in all these documents is that SQL fails to report time after time when it breaks rules, even though it's legally mandated to do just that. Facilities don't keep track of basic information about kids, and there are over 400 proven violations in these documents here of reporting or case documentation rules. What that means is that everything we have here, all of these documents, is probably just the tip of the iceberg. We're seeing violations across many different SQL facilities. These range from unsanitary conditions, lack of staff training, lack of supervision by staff, to over 250 complaints of child abuse, about a third of those are fully substantiated by investigators. We counted more than 80 improper restraints, like the one that killed Cornelius. I don't feel like a restraint is ever useful, like in any facilities or anywhere, like, oh, a kid might get restrained because he had anger issues. So how about you sit down and talk to that kid? Were you restrained a lot? I was restrained, I don't, I don't know, how many times, I don't know. I came out with scars and bruises, and those scars and bruises came from me because I want to fight and get up and get away. Like, I don't want you big old man, grown man laying on top of me. Like, look at Cornelius, that's not safety. But it's like, this is what the staff was taught. They told me in my training, the kids say anything to get up out of their restraint. 
I can't breathe. Mom, help me, help me. And which happened to me in multiple occasions that I was involved in a restraint, which a kid told me he couldn't breathe. I'm like, oh, this restraint is right by the book, the way that they taught me. Restraints are supposed to be emergency safety interventions used when a student puts themselves or someone else in imminent danger. So I would want to go behind her. And when I'm behind her, I will wrap up this arm and wrap up this arm and swim. But then she's going to fight. Uh, you want to put your knee in her and get her off of balance. When right, you're right, locked right, in, tap, tap, no. <laughs> So normally what happens is we just take the kids to the ground. They're fighting. I can't hold on. I can't hold on. Grab the legs. Boom. Oh, shit. Boom. Easier and more effective. So I guess there was a moment where I was kind of like in the air uh -huh. when you were pulling me back, but I landed softly. Uh -huh. But I can imagine if I were struggling. Struggling, uh-huh. I yeah. might not land as oh, no. easily. No. If we're doing that, you're struggling and you're not landing easily. You seem like you got agitated just now. Is that <laughs> how a restraint, doing a restraint really was? Uh, yes, I would say uh, a restraint is very, very, very stressful and it exerts a lot of energy. Um, restricting somebody's movement is not fun. It's not fun. And that's why I always say that if I could de-escalate a situation, I would much rather de-escalate. But sometimes you can't de-escalate a situation if you don't have staff to divide and conquer. After Cornelius died, Sequel told Vice News the company would reduce, minimize, and eventually eliminate the use of restraints on our campuses. But scrutiny of the conditions at Sequel's facilities continued. Seven states ended their contracts with the company. Sequel closed six facilities. And it told Vice News, when one of our facilities is closed, the likelihood of harm to the displaced youth increases. We regret that in some states, political pressure has resulted in rush decisions that prioritized media narratives over the best possible care for the individual. But that wasn't the end of Sequel. And it's definitely not the end of the multi-billion dollar business of youth residential treatment. Clorinda is Sequel's flagship program. It's been open since 1992, and the company based all of the treatment models that it uses at its facilities around the country on the stuff that it devised right here. But it's actually closing. Because of the scrutiny that the company's been facing from regulators, from journalists, it's in the process of getting rid of all of its kids and discharging them and sending them to new facilities, foster homes in some cases. And so what we're gonna capture here is really the end of an era. Esa fue la, la como la línea de la propiedad. Oh, esta es la línea de la propiedad. So solo podíamos caminar hasta aquí. In January, Kevin Ramirez was discharged from Clarinda Academy as the company decided to permanently close it down. When he met us there to show us the campus, it was his first time back. Yo sabía que tú no estabas bien. Tú tratabas de hacerte fuerte. ¿Verdad? Ya, yeah, por eso me siento como raro, porque siempre cuando estaba aquí uh -huh. me sentí como, tú sabes, atrapado. Kevin says a judge sent him to Clorinda after he was caught with weed. While there, he went through substance abuse counseling and a lot more. Were you allowed to go outside? Not without a staff for like precautions, just in case you try to run. Kids in uh, a foster dorm, they try to like run because like they were just sad, you know? They didn't have a family. You never knew where they were gonna go. They were just gonna run to run. You came here to visit Kevin. What was that like? Desde la primera vez que yo vine, él nunca me abrazaba como lo hice esa vez. Él me abrazó y sonreía, pero yo no. Le veía su rostro muy triste. En mi país, a mí me crecieron a golpes. Crecí mano dura, le dicen en mi país, mis padres. Pero en este país no es así. Y venir a un lugar 
saber que tu hijo lo ponen como gallo de pelea, pelear para que coma, se pelean por ropa. Es, se siente que hay impotencia como padre. Pienso que en vez de que le hicieran un bien, esa academia lo que le hizo fue un mal a que ve. Porque de ahí no ha salido mejor él, no. Él salió peor de ese lugar. In 2018, Disability Rights Washington published an investigation into allegations of verbal abuse and excessive restraints at Clarinda Academy. Sequel disputed the report, saying it was filled with, quote, false statements. And the company reached out to other states that were its clients to defend its record. In a letter that we have here to the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare, Sequel suggests the agency contact their local marketing executive and writes, quote, we are deeply offended by the characterization that we put profits ahead of our mission. The thing is, problems persisted. We reviewed new complaints from 2019 and 2020. Among these complaints, inspectors noted that residents' files were missing important information, including the names of their legal guardians, residents were moving in without care plans, some staff were not fully vetted before they were hired, and the restraints continued. One dorm reported 117 restraints just in June of 2019. I got there on June 11th, so... Like, 2020, right? Yep, in the summertime. Well, we had actually pulled in right past the prison, and my transporter told me that's where I was going. And I was like, what? And he goes, I'm just kidding. It's over here. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's... <laughs> he said he does that to everybody. <laughs> that prison is right next to Clarinda Academy. The two institutions even share a kitchen. Like Kevin, Luca Lean says he was sent to Clarinda for weed. I was on house arrest waiting to go to Clarinda. So I was kind of like looking into it to see where I was going to go. What did you learn? Just that there had been like abuse allegations, harsh restraints, and that a lot of states were pulling out of that facility and not sending kids there no more. And I mean, from what I had read, I had assumed that it was not going to be a very good time. Clarinda Academy housed kids from the justice system together with foster kids. That's not unusual in residential treatment facilities, often considered the modern reimagination of another well-known institution, the orphanage. Orphanages fell out of fashion in the 20th century, but not all kids were easy to place in families. Towards the end of the century, as prisons started housing people who'd previously been in mental hospitals, institutions for juvenile criminals started taking in orphans. The beginning of residential treatment was because kids failed at foster home. So there's usually serious uh, behavioral health problems, either a major mental illness or a behavior problem. There's typically high-risk behaviors, suicide, danger to others, uh, cutting, um, you know, self-mutilation type activities, so running away. It means that residential treatment is sort of like the last stop, that it's the place that, where kids end up, where other people have, don't really want them anymore. They don't really feel like they can be successful with them. In the small town of Clarinda, Iowa, a microcosm of the national development played out. A huge mental hospital in the town emptied out, and the correctional facility was added to its grounds. Then, parts of the vacant hospital were taken over by Clarinda Academy. James Hindman, founder of the Jiffy Lube franchise, started the academy. He continued to run it when the company later became Sequel. In 1991, Heinemann conceived a way to invest in kids society had given up on while building profit for shareholders and saving money for taxpayers. The program was designed for juvenile delinquents. It promised to turn, quote, tax eaters into taxpayers. Oh, well, here's the nice one. This is the campus exec jacket. What's that? That's like top eagle on the campus. You get that. So you were like the basically student body president type thing? Yeah, like the whole campus. Did they have, who elected you? The, the program leader. I got this one too. I actually okay, you're wear wearing this. that one. Yeah, I actually wear this. I like this one. It's like an old school one. 
They were gonna engrave my name into this one, but I got sent home too early. So they didn't end up doing it. So is it a normal high school? No, <laughs> no way, no way. So by day it was a normal high school, but then like at night everything would just pop off. And... In 1999, Sequel was set up, specifically to run Clorinda. Today, Sequel markets its residential facilities as therapeutic places where kids can be treated for a range of behavioral problems or trauma. But a hallmark of the program, the so-called peer support model, was a behavioral control strategy for Clorinda's original population coming out of the justice system. The idea, enforcing compliance through peer pressure, basically getting good kids to lead the bad. Staff could dole out group punishments for individual offenses, and they ranked residents weekly. Positive rankings led to privileges and membership in an elite group called the Eagles. Did students who had status ever abuse their power? Yeah, I mean, kids would, they knew they could get away with stuff more. So, I mean, they would do things that other kids couldn't do. I talked to one kid who said he actually restrained other kids sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if there was short staff and you wanted to look good and maybe get like a positive rating that week, you would like help out. And I mean, I've had times where I've had to help out a staff like restrain kids because they're the only one there. Physical restraints were frequent and the peer support model might have been part of the problem. We have here a report from inspectors who went to a different sequel facility in Iowa, Woodward Academy. This facility had just implemented a new rule that actually limited peer interventions. What the students reported was that support by peers used to be, quote, too confrontive. And when the facility changed its rules, inspectors observed that campus-wide interventions decreased significantly and children's comments about the changes were overwhelmingly positive. The state knew that kids did better when they weren't policing each other. And still, Sequel was allowed to claim that its peer support model was therapeutic. Caseworkers, parole officers, and judges kept sending kids there. My first few months being there, there was only one or two staff on the dorm and just a huge fight broke out, a bunch of kids, and there just wasn't enough people to stop it. Had you ever watched something like that before? No, that was, that was pretty crazy. Did the environment feel safe? No, not at all. Like my first and second month there, like I, I was like, okay, I gotta watch out for these kids. I don't know them. I don't know what they've been through. If like someone just comes into my room, like closes the door, the staff they won't hear me. That's like the thing that like worried me. Okay, if anything happens, like I can only defend myself. That's when like throughout the program, I started like defending myself a lot more. Kevin and Luca said that a sequel dealt with COVID and the fallout from Cornelius's death. Things got chaotic. They stopped going to school and never got credit for the semester. Especially during COVID, we didn't have access to the computers because they were in the school building. But even when we did, oftentimes they were broken. And I know myself and a few other kids were starting to get really concerned about how these things we were doing were going to translate to high school credits because we were thinking about obviously coming home at some point. Hello, I'm Leonard. This unit is all about using clear language in your writing. What classes are you in right now? Oh, I do math, two language arts, so social studies, and science, and uh, writing. Welcome to the lesson. Do you say I and write from your personal perspective? Do you say you and directly address the reader? Do you not do either of those and take a more objective approach, saying he, she, and they? What did you think when you heard that Clorinda was closing? I wasn't surprised because we knew what was going on, but we knew eventually somebody else would and right away it'd get closed down. Like the condition, like the facility was in and just the things that were going on there, I knew it wasn't gonna stay open for much longer. Outside on our home passes, like we'd search up stuff about Clorinda. We'd see like the news report and they're like, yeah, like they're not lying. Well, what are we supposed to do? Like go out, like tell the police. I mean, we're in there and we're juveniles too. Like they're not gonna 
believe a juvenile over like an adult, you know? So-called residential treatment today can be a lot of things. From these restrictive boarding schools to troubled teen programs like the one Paris Hilton attended and has since campaigned against. Staff verbally abused me, calling me for older names. That should never be said to a child. In a statement, Sequel told Vice News that our industry is well-regulated by multiple state agencies and accredited and monitored by industry organizations. Programs make bold claims about how they'll change a kid, but there is no federal oversight of what can be called treatment in this industry. Sad reality is, you know, the most common referral into a residential treatment centers is a different residential program. So it's typically what actually happens is kids bounce around in this out of community setting. It's very hard to take kids and bring them back in the community. There's a reason the business exists, politics, starting with a panic about crime and poverty in the 1990s. In 1991, Newt Gingrich became Speaker of the House and went after aggressive welfare reform. If your choice is a weak old baby dying in a dumpster or an orphanage, an orphanage is a heck of a lot better. If your choice is a seven-year-old, as in Florida, being beaten to death, or life in an orphanage, an orphanage is better. The Work Opportunity and Personal Responsibility Act aimed to restrict payments to any unmarried parents who had kids when they were younger than 18. The Republican-sponsored welfare reform bill currently before Congress proposes the creation of state-run orphanages to house the illegitimate children of teenage mothers. In the middle of this debate, the Wall Street Journal profiled Clorinda's founder, James Hindman, saying, Suppose Newt Gingrich gets his way and orphanages dot America's landscape. Don't be surprised if James Hindman ends up running a lot of them. For profit. Gingrich's funding package for orphanages didn't pass. But new state funding for juvenile lockups did. And that paid for the expansion of Hindman's company, Youth Services International. And with the lines between criminal justice and social care blurred, companies like Hindman's were poised to provide foster care within juvenile justice settings. By 2020, Sequel would be one of the biggest for-profit providers of youth residential treatment in the country. What is behind this movement to house kids of many different backgrounds all together in the same facility? Well, it's efficiency. If you're a director of a residential facility, you, you need to have your referral streams as open as possible. So you're willing to take from whomever is willing to send. The margin is in the amount of money you spend on people in the residential facilities. The staff. The staff. And so they hire the lowest paid, least experienced people in the system. And if you don't have a good layer of supervision and leadership, you end up with a Lord of the Flies kind of problem where you have, you know, young adults with unresolved adolescent issues trying to help adolescents with significantly unresolved issues. My name is Sam Campbell. I am a former employee of Sequel Youth Services, um, upper management. I was a program director as well as a group living director. So I've grown up in the inner city and I've seen great things happen. I've seen horrible things happen, but I've seen it all. Sam Campbell was hired at Sequel's Lakeside facility in Michigan in 2012. Among 125 boys, a mix of gang members, sexual offenders, and foster kids, Campbell met Cornelius Frederick. I had a great relationship with Cornelius. Gave Cornelius a lot of clothes, spent a lot of time with him. Were you surprised that that restraint killed Cornelius? Yeah, I was very surprised. That's nowhere near the worst restraint I've seen in a sequel facility. Campbell rose through the ranks, and sequel seems to have trusted him, sending him to work at facilities in Ohio and Arizona. Over his time there, Campbell says Lakeside changed. The approach to dealing with the kids became a lot more corporate. Say they had a kid that nobody else would take. No other facility in the United States would take this kid. OK, we're going to charge you $500 a day per diem and another $5,000 a month. And the states would say yes. Of course. While Campbell worked at Lakeside, Michigan started contracting with Sequel to take kids from the foster system. 
at a day rate of more than $300 per child. He claims other kids were discharged early to make space. How often do you think it was that a kid's discharge was because of financial reasons? 20, 30 percent of the time. Direct care staff and program directors fighting with management because they're taking a kid that we've been with for six to nine months, developing this relationship with, and this kid doesn't have a discharge plan. I think the worst farce in any case management plan for a kid is saying that after the program, he's going to discharge the foster care. That is the hardest thing to get done because honestly, who's taking a 16, 17, 18 year old aggressive kid into foster care? Now we got to try to come up with different things for this kid to do and, and sometimes it was discharging them to a homeless shelter. You discharged kids to homeless shelters? I can think of seven or eight that had happened to while I, in my career. Sequel didn't respond to Campbell's allegations, but in a previous statement about Cornelius' death at Lakeside, said, we cannot comment on pending legal matters. That said, we are deeply saddened by the tragic loss of Cornelius and acted quickly to terminate all staff involved. One of those staff was Campbell's close friend, Michael Mosley. Campbell says he left Sequel because the company let Mosley and two fellow staffers take the fall for Cornelius' death. Mosley is awaiting trial on criminal charges and has pleaded not guilty. But Campbell himself is also a controversial figure. Other Lakeside care staff and students said he helped shape the facility's problematic culture. One student said he beat kids up. A staff member said he brought drugs to campus. Campbell denied these allegations. Whatever people said about me, like, I'm in the trenches. I'm working 160, 170 hours a week. Like, I'm with kids every day. Like, something, you know, you're bound, somebody's bound to say something about you. Have I made mistakes before? Yes. I told them about my mistakes myself. I did hear that you yourself were responsible for several improper restraints that you, you know, beat up on the kids. Never beat up on a kid before. I've never been cited for beating up on a kid. I don't, I don't know where that would go from. In 2017, Sequel attracted a majority equity investment from Altamont Capital Partners, a private equity firm which also owns part of the Alamo Draft House movie theater chain. The investment was intended to allow Sequel to expand. It projected a single facility would earn $1.8 million in profit for 2020. At the time of the investment, two-thirds of profit went directly to corporate. But in interviews, clinicians from several facilities told us that as the company grew, they were left fighting for meager resources. Everything was for corporate was about the dollar. If there's an open bed, fill the bed. And it was like, well, no, I'm not going to put like a sexual trauma, like six-year-old victim on the same unit as a 15-year-old sexual predator. My budget as speech therapist for four and a half years was a steady zero. Part of the business model is exactly this. These kids are throwaways of society. So the odds of any backlash from them or people affiliated or associated with them is super minimal. Who, who really wants to work with these kids? Your average Walmart shopper? No, people who have a heart for it. Why do they have a heart for it? Something happened to them. Bottom right. Bottom right. Blue. Blue. That was a total mess, dude. Really? You never even got the paper. <laughs> what? <laughs> so. No, I got the paper. No, this is me. You never even got the paper. I, I hit there. Oh. This is going to seem kind of odd, but NSI probably saved my life. I was actually rather suicidal and had nowhere to go and basically applied for NSI because unemployment said I had to. So I applied, interviewed, got the job, and was not totally on my behind. It's like, okay, I've never done anything like this before. Now what? <laughs> NSI, Normative Services Academy, Inc., is maybe the most remote of all sequel facilities. It's in Wyoming, between the Bighorn Mountains and a huge plain. One of the closest towns is called Recluse. Since he left NSI, Guy, a former resident, 
meets his mentor, Kathleen, a former care worker, every month. Working with these kids and seeing with, that they had the potential to not go through what I went through as an adult made me feel like I had found my calling because I really want to keep him away from what I felt for all those years. I'm aiming correctly. I don't want him to feel that he doesn't matter. I don't want him to feel that he's completely unimportant to society. You had kids that didn't need to be there and kids that didn't need to be there and you shoved them all together and, and that's where it messed things up. You know, it wasn't all, you know, bad, but you know, I think sometimes there was days that just kind of... Positive outcomes, I think, were something that were not the norm. Guy came to NSI from the foster system. Like many foster kids who end up in residential treatment, he bounced from one program to another for years. I was in YBGR for most of my life. What's that? Yellowstone Boys and Girls Ranch. Um, And I was there for six years. And then from YBGR, I went to YPHP. YPHP, I went to Youth Services. Youth Services went to Excel. From Excel, went to Piney Ridge. From Piney Ridge, went back to Excel. From Excel, went to NSI. NSI went to MYCA, Foster Home, and then SILS. So 10 places total. That's so many. What was your first day at NSI like? I'm nervous, you know, new people, new start. They had driven me down the road to head to the med center. I got back in the car after taking my temperature, uh, um, taking a shower for lice and getting changed into what they would change you into, which is an NSI jumpsuit, basically. What did they say the point of you being there was? So in a therapeutic setting, everybody has to have their own treatment because everybody has their own issues. Mine was more of getting angry, and that actually had started kicking up at NSI, not getting better, but kicking up because of everything that was going on. This is the folder of documents we got back from Wyoming where NSI is located. One allegation that was substantiated is that children were frequently unsupervised. One resident who needed one-on-one care was left alone, and she was later found in the bathroom with a belt around her neck. One child was put in a physical restraint for not, quote, sitting quietly. What we have here is a notice of non-compliance. The allegation, which was eventually substantiated by investigators, is that a staff put his hands around a child's neck. When licensing went to investigate, they found evidence of another incident that had occurred a year earlier, where the staff had put his hands around a different child's neck, quote, held him down, stated he was going to kill the child, and then grabbed the child's neck in a choking manner. Licensing questions the organization on why a report to law enforcement was not made, and the organization's contact person responded, quote, I'm not sure why I didn't do it. I guess I felt bad for the guy. He was having a bad day, and I knew he was going to be let go. So we have here documentation that someone who was employed at NSI actually had a history of abuse and neglect and was on Wyoming's central registry. And this wasn't the only person that NSI didn't vet and then hired. A state investigation found 25 staff lacked background checks in out-of-state child abuse registers. We spent um, a lot more time in the last couple of years out there investigating student on staff, student on student, um, assault, battery, unlawful touch, um, those types of things. We would be out there, you know, 11 times a weekend investigating 11 different um, reports of battery or assault. We're looking at pretty low manpower, so we can't dedicate a full-time deputy to, uh, you know, a for-profit company that's, that's bringing students in from out of state. For years, local press wrote about NSI's runaway problem. Escapees stole cars, trying to get back home. Sequel responded by adding alarms to the windows. They started locking kids' shoes away while they were indoors. That's an entrance into part of NSI. So they would run along this road when they ran away? they They would go down the creek bottom. The creek runs behind the facility. You know, when it's not cloudy, um, you can see all the Bighorn Mountains down this draw here. You can see them, they're covered in snow. 
yeah, what are you going to do if Other you're running houses. into the wilderness? I mean, yeah. you're going to be needing shelter. Yeah, it's late April right now, and look at the weather out here. I mean, there's only about three yeah. months of, of the year that, that you can be out in a t-shirt in the middle of the night in Sheridan County. The professionals in that field need to reevaluate what it looks like for juvenile placement in America. Uh, we realized a long time ago that the best placement for juveniles is within the community where they're from. Guy's life after residential facilities has been unstable. He recently reconnected with his mom while living in a transitional program for young adults. She had nowhere to live and moved in with him. As a result, he was kicked out of the program. When we met, they were staying at a motel outside Billings, but that didn't last long. Oh shit, okay. Uh, I just got a text back from mom. She said, Gaetano, we need to move out tonight. If you can please wrap up as soon as possible and get back here, I would greatly appreciate it. I think some shit went down. What happened? I'm so sorry to hear that. It's okay. This has just been my life for the past month or two because of not having my apartment. Where are you going to go? I don't know. It's always a new adventure. Although Scandal follows the company, many states are still doing business with Sequel. Emails Vice News obtained from inside the state agencies that license and contract with Sequel shed some light on why. For one, Sequel markets its services aggressively. Idaho Child Welfare ended a contract with the company in 2015. But by mid-2020, a contract manager said Sequel was reaching back out, despite a long record of complaints. This is a spreadsheet of complaints that we logged after FOIAing Idaho about sequels violations. One incident report notes a child was restrained for longer than 15 consecutive minutes, which is against policy because it is dangerous physically. We have a child who was crying, saying staff is abusing me. Required orientation was not documented in files for new employees. Orientation includes uh, training on how to de-escalate situations rather than uh, restraining kids. Out-of-state agencies also did business with Sequel, and they couldn't access these complaint histories directly. This frustrated one child welfare worker in Texas. In an email, they wrote, Texas Child Protective Services places children at Sequel, yet we have no way of reviewing this provider's compliance history. In Utah, a riot closed the Red Rock Canyon School, but the Associate Commission at Texas Child Protective Services found out about it through a listserv. We have not been contacted by the facility to this point that I am aware of. So here's something else that's interesting. Also after that riot, Utah licensing workers discussed whether they could publicly post substantiated violations in residential treatment. And they concluded that although it would be legal, given the uproar providers are currently in over investigations, I suspect they'll fight back hard or quit. So even after repeated violations, agencies are reluctant to confront or crack down too hard on Sequel. In an example from Wyoming, the Department of Family Services got an email from a woman claiming she worked at NSI. I am writing because I recently got hired by NSI Inc. and Sheridan, and I was so appalled by the multiple violations that I quit after I was told to mind my business after I voiced my concerns to upper management. The kids are not safe. The staff are untrained and do not supervise the children. Once on site, it's clear to any sane person that NSI is out of control. Days later, DFS recommended a one-year license renewal for NSI. One staff member questioned this. Why not a six-month provisional, they wrote. The number of reports is staggering. We asked DFS why it recommended a license renewal for NSI given the company's record. The agency told us in a statement that NSI was not an outlier among residential facilities and that, quote, the number of critical incident reports was in proportion to those received by smaller facilities with a lower census. In other words, staggering numbers of reports might be the norm. 
Sequel is far from the only company in the residential treatment industry that's amassed a long list of documented violations. Yet these companies continue to operate. Some, like Sequel, post large profits at the taxpayer's expense. One reason is the chronic shortage of placements for foster kids. Between 2012 and 2017, the number of children in foster care increased by more than 11%, a development partly driven by the opioid crisis. Agencies increasingly resorted to private solutions for traumatized, hard-to-place kids, often hundreds of miles away from their homes. It took Cornelius Frederick's death and a year of media coverage for just seven states to sever ties with Sequel. And the company still operates. 24 residential treatment facilities in 11 states. You don't have to get that all on one fork. <laughs> I don't know, I'm almost done. <laughs> and you can scoop it up later there, see? <laughs> I don't understand about the shovel big mouthfuls in that you guys do. I really don't. Be fast, you know? Because even in even in real life, you only got certain times you got, or you got to be finished eating by. Yeah, that was the, something that ticked a lot of the kids off at NSI was having only 30 minutes to eat. Oh, they're lucky they had 30. Or, well, there. We... But you get what I'm saying. You know? I get what you're saying. Is there anything you want adults to know about your time at Clorinda? That, like, if they had their kids there to talk to them, just because, like, they don't, they don't know everything. Just like my mom, she didn't know everything until like I got out. I felt like I was there for like a really little reason. And, and then I, it changed you. Yeah, and it changed me. Like if a friend asked me now, like, why do you look behind you all the time? Like, oh, it's just like something I got used to. Now. My mom tells me all the time, that's not normal though. That's not normal for a kid your age just to like be paranoid if someone like runs up on you. I'm like, it became normal to me throughout time. Where do you think the kids in residential facilities should be? So there's some kids in there that committed crimes and like, yeah, you gotta serve time for the crime you did. But then it's kids there that like me, foster care kids, like we're here because we don't have a family. It gets to me sometimes when I think about it like, it's pretty bold like how the system of find a, e a real easy way to make money. How does it make you feel to know that you're a um, profit? I feel like, a, like, I don't feel like I'm a slave, but like, that's what my mindset was. It's like, they try to treat me like I'm a slave. Like, oh, sit here and be here, and then we'll move you somewhere else. Like, they just pass me around like it's basketball or something, and that's not how I like it to be like. What else has changed? I'm trying to, we're trying to get housing, okay. so. Uh, we applied for different apartments. So it's, you know, it's rough, but I'll get through it. <laughs> yeah, life, is, life isn't going to get any easier. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, and I, I look at it this way. Those who look into the past or the present are certain to miss the future. Right. Yeah. 